Hi, everyone. I'm Fatima Zaidi, the founder and CEO of Quill, which is a full service podcast production agency for Fortune 500 and enterprise brands. I'm thrilled to be the moderator of today's session, focusing on the accelerated shift to digital and customer centric experiences. As we all know, the impact of COVID-19 on the way we pay has been staggering. The shift to digital payments was already underway, but virtually overnight customers and businesses were forced to pivot to digital payments that allows for curbside pickup, takeout, and delivery. This pivot was driven by necessity to meet public health guidelines and restrictions, but Canadians quickly adapted with long-lasting impacts on customer experience expectations. I'm thrilled to introduce today's incredible lineup of panelists. We're joined by Alyssa Polanski, who is the Senior Director of E-Commerce Product and Technology at Walmart Canada, Marta Jozowska, Director of Product, Payment and Retail Solutions at Moneris, Simon Chu, who is the Payment Experience Product Management at Rogers Communications, and James Good, who is the AVP of Partnerships at Interact. Today, we'll be covering a few very different topics, how businesses are pivoting their operations to meet changing customer expectations, how they're leveraging digital payments to support business growth, and where they see customer experiences evolving in the next three to, three to five years. With that, I'll let them introduce themselves in a little bit more detail along with their respective companies. Simon, we'll begin with you handing over to Marta, James, and then we'll end with Alyssa. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, as you said, uh, my name is Simon Chu. I'm from Rogers Communications. I'm uh, the Director of Product Management there. And our goal at Rogers is really to provide access and connectivity to all Canadians through wireless and fixed internet service at the speeds and reliability that our customers expect. But as an organization beyond our core products, we place a real focus on providing exceptional customer journeys as a way to really differentiate ourselves with our competitors. And payments is one of those uh, moments of truth that are embedded in many of those journeys. And the work we do to remove friction in the payments experience uh, enables revenue growth and drives cost efficiencies that I'll talk about later. Uh, I've been with Rogers for the past 14 years and I've been looking at the after the payments portfolio for two years now. As part of the customer experience organization, I lead payment strategy, roadmap build and delivery, and I work closely with our sales and service channels to drive digital payment adoption. Uh, lastly, I'm also responsible for managing our emergent fee budget. Uh, last statement I'll just make is Canadians 365 days of the year are paying Rogers for their services and we process over $13 billion in payments annually. Basically, my job day in and day out is to figure out how as uh, an organization, can we eradicate customer friction in the end-to-end -end payments experience? Uh, and on that note, I'll pass it off to, uh, believe. It's Marta. Marta, Marta yeah. <laughs> yes. Perfect, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Marta Shulska. I've been with Moneris for just over 15 years, and right now my role is the Director of Product for Retail and Payment Solutions. Um, so throughout my tenure at Moneris, I've had a number of different roles and worked throughout the US and Canada, but most importantly, my expertise is really in technology, product design, management, and strategy, as well as uh, consulting with merchants and developers. So Moneris, uh, we're the number one payment processor and acquirer in Canada, and we're really focused on solutions for merchants of all sizes. So that's everything from micro customers and micro businesses that are just starting up all the way through to the major enterprises throughout the country. And we're really focused on offering both out of the box and merchant business solutions, as well as things like foundational integrated payment options. And that obviously ranges throughout the gamut of how we do payments. Everything from um, card present POS solutions all the way through to full sets of digital product options. And uh, this is definitely a very interesting topic and, and kind of my um, core area of interest. So really looking forward to this panel. Great, thank you. We'll uh, throw it over to, why don't we start with the listen and end with James. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here today. Uh, as Fatima mentioned, I'm the Senior Director of Product for E-Commerce Technology at Walmart Canada. In thinking of preparing for this panel, I, I was thinking of five years ago when I joined Walmart and just the journey that we've been on on the technology team. When I started, we had one squad for all of the front end of the website, which is amazing to think of now where we are with like 30 to 40 squads and a microservice architecture. And I know a lot of the people on the call and on the panel have been through this similar journey. So I'm really excited to kind of talk about payments today 
um, in this new world where we have the ecosystem of microservice architecture and how it plays a role. In my role, I look at the overarching customer journey from a track top of the funnel to shop, transact, which is what we're talking about today, fulfill, care, and back up to the top of the funnel. Um, and one of the things we you know, live by, we truly, the product yardstick that we measure all of our pro uh, projects with is we wanna save Canadians money so they can live better. And so, you know, I, I thought that was a bit hokey before I joined five years ago, but actually we live, eat and breathe that mantra and we truly test, you know, all of our projects against that yardstick. So really looking forward to talking today more about payments and the increasingly important role that payments plays in online retailing. So I'm really excited to be here and kind of provide that point of view. And uh, with that, I'll pass it on to James. Excellent. Uh, really, really excited to be here. So my name is James Good, AVP of Commercial Partnerships at Interac, uh, an organization that I imagine is well known to most people uh, on this panel or attending this panel, but you know, just very quickly, um, you know, we're key to the way Canadians uh, choose to pay and get paid. Uh, for close to 40 years now, we've offered secure, low cost, real time access to funds for consumers and merchants. And we do that all under what we call good funds or, or no chargeback model. So, um, but you know, not surprisingly, we're chosen 18 million times a day by Canadians. We'll move $500 billion across the platform this year in more than six and a half billion transactions. Um, I've been at Interact 12 years and like Marta, I've had um, you know, the luxury of occupying a bunch of different roles within the organization and getting to see uh, a lot of parts of, of, of what we're doing. But for the last say 18 months, I've been in this commercial partnerships role. Um, I guess, you know, quantitatively that means focusing on top line. How do we drive more revenue into the organization? But more interesting to me, that means working with our partners to figure out how do we meet the meet the needs they have now. But more interestingly, how do we understand what their strategic roadmaps look like, what their vision of um, where things are going, and and you know what I'm most excited about is uh, while I've been in payments for for twenty some years, there's this great convergence now of payments and loyalty and e receipts, and so. Uh, it continues to get more and more exciting. So I'm actually quite interested to hear what my other pan these panelists are going to say about uh, their organizations and how how they're um, viewing payments, not necessarily as a standalone, but as as part of uh, um, overall experience for their customers. Great, thank you, James. Well, on the back of those introductions, we certainly have the most qualified experts to join us here for this conversation, so I'm very excited. A quick housekeeping rule for everyone watching, we will be doing a quick Q&A session at the end, so if you do have any questions that come up throughout the course of this conversation, feel free to drop them in the Q&A chat. Um, it should be on the top right uh, hand browser, top right hand corner of your browser. So I want to take the pandemic out of the equation for, for my first question, which really is directed to, to all of you, which is how important is digital payments in supporting overall business growth? I mean, even pre-pandemic, I think that was a conversation a lot of us were sort of exploring. And uh, maybe, Alyssa, we'll start with you, move on to Marta from there, and then we can end with Simon. Thank you so much, Fatima. I was really excited about this question because I think a lot of folks in online retail underestimate the impact that the lower funnel has on conversion and overall revenue and GMV. I think when I look at my ecosystem, you know, there's a lot of focus on top of the funnel, shopping journey, you know, making sure everything's great to kind of lure the customer, the fees, the third parties. But where I've actually seen the most impact and the and the most return on investment for my initiatives have been in lower funnel uh, in the last 12 uh, 12 months before covid we introduced a new payment type and that allowed us to grow 106 basis points on checkout conversion. So a huge impact just from introducing one new payment type. And I think it's a really strong lever that retailers have to pull. And it's also really about inclusion, right? We wanna, increasing your tender types and lower funnels about increasing the size of the pie, which is extremely important and giving all Canadians access to you know the um, goods and services so I i'm really excited about this space um, and the opportunity that it presents for retailers 
Well, right. we'll throw it over to you. Oh, yeah, we'll throw it over to you. Perfect. Um, so I guess my short answer to this would be uh, digital payments are critical. And I'm going to say they're critical no matter what industry you're in, no matter what size of business you are. Because prior to the pandemic, there seems to be a misconception that digital applied to a select few. Or it was heavily focused on retail, for instance, but not necessarily all other industries. Or it was a luxury of major businesses, but not necessarily affordable or accessible to small business. So I think whether the pandemic had happened this shift towards digital we were on this journey already all it did was really just kind of exacerbate it and speed it up and we've seen drastic shift over the last few years but it's not going to slow down so it's not like this is going to stop and now we're going to just keep going back to the old traditional way of doing things it's just going to keep speeding up from here because we've set expectations with consumers. So for any business, no matter what industry and whatever the size to stay competitive, this is critical. And Alyssa said it, if it's uh, payment types, if it's um, access of how you pay, when you pay, where you pay, um, all of that level of flexibility for consumers, that's gonna be critical. And I'm gonna say, it's every single one of the industries that are out there. We're seeing adoption in digital in oil and gas, right? Not an industry that we would have traditionally thought of because you figure you're gonna have to physically go and pick up gas, but we're seeing mobile wallets in that industry already. Um, things that were check-based before. So we're seeing invoices for things such as uh, B2B, traditional payments are already having to shift over to digital. and to stay competitive, every single industry is gonna to have to look and reevaluate how they do business. Thank you, Marta. Uh, I'm gonna take it a little bit different lens as a, being a service industry in a telco. I see it as a very important, huge opportunity to enable overall business growth uh, coming from uh, Rogers. And first and foremost, think if you think about the cost of service through our own contact centers as a, as a business like Rogers, it's quite high. So if a customer makes a payment with us over the phone versus having the customer pay us digitally, you see immediate margin improvement and savings on service costs. Uh, that would be the first reason that it really helps by driving digital payment adoption. The second reason why it's important to Rogers as service providers, bills uh, we bill our customers on a monthly base, uh, basis. And because payments is a key moment of truth that provides a unique opportunity to engage with our customers every month, it gives us that opportunity to build loyalty with them. So driving digital payment adoption allows us to steer customers to pay in an ecosystem that we can control and is more manageable to give them the experience we want uh, in the Rogers app, as an example. So when a customer makes a payment in their app, it's easier for us to really automate, target customers with proactive and personalized offers, upsell, cross-sell to them, uh, things that we can't do as easily or uh, as automated or as uh, personalized as say over the phone or in retail. So at a minimum, I would say, you know, we can target customers and reward them for their loyalty and tenure as well with Rogers, uh, with a surprise and delight benefit when we get them onto digital, uh, giving them free content, discounts from our partners, things like that. And all this leads to customer satisfaction, lower churn for us. And uh, I, I really wanna double down on and emphasize how important digital payments is as a moment of truth is uh, for us and our customers. Because when I think of our organization, we actually don't have the opportunity to engage with them and talk to them as much uh, Usually it takes up to two years before they're ready to upgrade their next phone, or they're calling us because they're irate and they've experienced some type of friction. So really payments is that best neutral place to start with to, to really build loyalty and talk to them and have a conversation where we can drive some of that revenue growth. And I'll pass it off to Thanks, James, Simon. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no worries. No worries. So, you know, it's interesting. Lockdown was May 14th of 2020, and here we are 15 months later. Still feels like we're in lockdown, but uh, I am curious, how did your respective businesses pivot to meet changing customer expectations? And I'd also like to hear about some of the backdoor conversations your teams were internally having. Maybe James, we can start with you for this one and then uh, move on to Alyssa and then Simon. Yeah, I think it might be um, interesting for the participants just to understand a little bit about how uh, payment mix changed uh, over interact platforms in, in the last, as you said, 14 months or so. So, and I don't want, as you said, I don't want to make this pandemic focused, but I'll talk a little bit about it anyway. Um, so, you know, what we saw early in the pandemic was obviously a shift away from POS transactions. 
Uh, and in fact, while total dollar spent was you know, down a bit, it was relatively stable. What we really saw that was most negatively impacted was the number of transactions. So it's not surprising when you think about uh, early in the pandemic, people, for example, might visit the grocery store less often, but buy more in that single trip. And I'm thinking specifically about the early days when we were all hoarding toilet paper for some unknown reason. Uh, I don't know why that was the most important thing, but we all remember it. So, you know, while those POS transactions were down for, for several months, or lower than expected for several months, we we're obviously in a much better space now. But during that period, we saw two stark improvements in digital transactions. So first, we saw a significant acceleration in our in-app and in-browser transactions using Apple Pay and Google Pay. Year-over-year uh, -year growth somewhere in the neighborhood of 400%. And a lot of that uh, was being driven by food delivery and the restaurant vertical. Those behavioral changes were really driven by consumer need at first. So either, uh, you know, the place you wanted to go was either closed or had a long lineup or you simply didn't want to go in public. I remember, you know, we were so paranoid in the early days, we wiped out every thing that came into the house with life of wipes. I think we've, we've kind of, we're still very... Oh, we're not careful, doing that anymore? We don't, we don't do that anymore, no. It's an Emma, yeah. yeah. So we were driven there by need, but I think what happened is it actually created um, an opportunity for a lot of people who might not have other, otherwise chosen these digital channels to clue into the fact that there's a ton of convenience. And so we're going to see stickiness beyond this pandemic. Yes, people will return to uh, shopping more in stores, to dining more in restaurants, but once you realize that convenience, um, you will continue to use it, if not as much as you are today, uh, you will continue to make it part of your, uh, you know, omni-channel purchase experience. So, um, you know, as a result of this, um, you know, as I said, we're seeing more demand from retailers to join our, our Apple Pay, Google Pay in-app service. Uh, Walmart announced last year that they'll be joining uh, this year, uh, joining merchants like Skip the Dishes, McDonald's, Dollarama, uh, and many more announcements coming uh, you know, over the coming months. So. Yes, we're excited Good about job. that. What's that? Good job. Thank you. Yeah. So we're super excited about that, but we're also, you know, keen to focus on the on the partnership piece. So uh, yay for joining our services, and we'd love to have more and more merchants, merchants do that. But we're really excited about working closely um, with merchants and retailers to help them be better prepared for what comes next. I think this this pandemic uh, created an opportunity to get closer to a lot of a lot of merchants. So that was one platform in app and browser. The other place where we saw meaningful improvement was um, on the Interact e-transfer platform, which had frankly sustained um, a strong growth for, trend for a couple of decades, but we overshot our objectives um, in 2020 and into 2021. Uh, not surprising again, given the ease of use of the service, the wide connectivity to Canadian banks and bank accounts, and the fact that today most Canadians have access to at least some free e-transfer transactions as part of their banking relationship, um, you know, not surprising. People just weren't seeing each other face to face, uh, and so that that growth rate actually accelerated beyond what we expected. So, yeah, down on POS, but you know, back to the point: those two digital platforms for in-app payments and 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 money movement really um, carried more than their expected weight over the last 12 to 14 months. Great, Alyssa, we'll hand it over to you, and I'm with you. We're still using the Lysol wipes over here. Totally. Thanks, Fatima. So I want to build on everything you said, James, plus one to all of that. And, you know, the shift in terms of changing trends, the shift we really observed was an acceleration in the adoption of online grocery. And I know from talking to friends and family, online grocery has changed my life as a mom of two young kids. I no longer have to pack everybody up on the Sunday and have my list and spend three hours in the store. I just do it all online and have everything delivered. But I remember before the pandemic, trying to kind of evangelize this to other mom friends and mom bloggers and they just didn't want to try it. it. Didn't they wanted to touch and feel their fruits and vegetables? And all of a sudden, with COVID, we all wanted to try and dip our toe into this service. And now, um, weekly shop, as we call it, our grocery makes up more than fifty percent of our transactions. So a huge growth 
in that area. And so the changes we had to make to keep up with the demand and also to support the new, I guess, health and safety of our customers were massive. And what I also wanted to highlight was the speed of those changes and kind of, I'm really proud of the team and how we were agile and adaptable. And I mean, now I have a new standard for what my engineering team can do. So now they've given me that um, idea. I, I can hold them to this standard. So leave my groceries at the doorstep, a huge one completed in five days by March 17th. Um, store seniors only. Remember, we had those hours for seniors only. Um, we enabled that online to sign up. A two-day turnaround launched on March 22nd. We enabled hospital locations as pickup points for online groceries to um, support the healthcare workers who were working round the clock and could not get to the grocery store. Seven-day turnaround on March 9th, and huge. Um, support from the medical community. GM curbside, I mean, I, the list goes on. We even um, recently last summer launched um, a queuing app. So to find out like what, how long the line was and sign up for skip the line um, to get in. And, you know, I think as we move forward, um, I think it, it creates a new standard for how we adapt to market context and being able to really address the needs of Canadians as they evolve. And I'm really excited to see how we can improve the weekly shop and make it more convenient, especially via payments. And I mean, Simon spoke about a few of them and I think we'll address them in a coming question, but how pay payments plays a role in making the shopping frequency and weekly shop online seamless, omni-channel, easy. Um, and so there's a lot there and I'll get into it in the next question, but I mean, I'm really proud of Walmart and kind of the support and guidance that we provided to Canadians in uh, a difficult time. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank Simon, you. I'll throw it over to you. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, yeah, a lot of the same uh, themes I would say I would echo Alyssa and James, you know, the last year has been surprising and full of opportunity as I'm sure it was for a lot of other companies as well, just like your, uh, yours as well. Uh, prior to the first lockdown, we had a significant number of customers picking, uh, making, making pill payments uh, through retail stores. So during the lockdown, we actually saw a shift of these customers to digital payment adoption. And we reached out to these customers in a targeted fashion through communications uh, to get them to pay through digital. And uh, the outreach really worked and we saw a good response with this. And after the first lockdown, we saw that we were able to really sustain this adoption of bill pay uh, on digital. And what this did is it actually resulted in Rogers doing a better job of serving those in retail that were there to actually shop and purchase. Uh, the customer never has to wait is a key guiding principle for Rogers and steering customers to pay through digital really allowed the sales channels to focus on sales and customers looking to buy. And, uh, and they didn't really have to wait anymore for customers that had to pay their bill there in front of them in line. So as I said, you know, before customers is a significant moment of truth uh, to really take advantage of promoting that uh, steering customers to digital allows us to have a sales confirmation uh, conversation with the customer uh, where the customer does not have to wait. So we can really manage the traffic better there. So what I loved about what happened is we started to steer the right traffic to the right place digitally and we have the right customers in the right sales channels in the right place where we want them to have the right the conversations uh, we'd like to see. And, you know, lastly, really that payment traffic relief we saw, it really helped with the challenge that we have uh, with how many customers we could have in the stores due to COVID. Generally, the retail footprint of our stores is not that large. And uh, this really helped us manage that safe physical distancing so that we could uh, keep our front line safe as well too, as our customers. And uh, lastly, I'll just briefly talk about affordability. Again, as a bill pay environment, uh, we were really worried about affordability and if our customers were really gonna be able to make their bill payments. So uh, when the pandemic started, we really went to work to think about how to keep service uh, available for our customers. So we didn't suspend anyone that could not pay their bill for the first three months. And then we started looking at how could we give them flexible payment options to help them make their payments. And uh, what we found is we actually had a lot of gaps in our digital payment experience. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity to provide customers payment arrangements, installment payment options. Uh, so these were some of the things that we started to look at accelerating in our roadmap to deliver for our customers, to give them that flexibility uh, to make their bill payments. Absolutely, Simon, we're on the same page at Walmart trying to enable <laughs> customers uh, that way as well and, and with a gap for us as well. So I think that that's a great point. Yeah. And I was going to end there. So I <laughs> appreciate that, Alyssa. That's good to know that we're even in the divergence in industries. We all have our gaps, right? All, we all, yes. the product teams are hiding <laughs> all the uh, 
the gaps in the products, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's clear that we are seeing an increased appetite for outside of the box solutions to help businesses deliver the seamless customer experiences enabled by digital payments. Um, what customer experiences do businesses need right now to incorporate to stay competitive and how can these digital payments uh, processes that you're talking about right now facilitate this uh, competitive edge? So I'm going to maybe we can start with Marta this time and then from there we'll move on to James and then Alyssa. Sure. Um, so I'm going to key on something that James said, which was the word convenience, right? That's what we took out of um, out of the pandemic. But at the same time, that right there is going to be the driving force of everything that we do going forward. So as any business going forward, if they want to stay competitive, what they're really going to have to look at is reevaluate your entire business model right? And really look at how can you offer convenience to your consumers, right? And that means essentially throughout that entire consumer journey. So really looking at, should we be separating the moment of when somebody's actually choosing the goods and services versus the moment that they're actually paying? So for instance, we had to do that during the pandemic. We're going to see that this drove adoption of consumers, which essentially now means they've gotten used to this convenience, right? So being able to um, select your goods online, maybe pay for them online, but then fit, pick them up curbside. Right. If we're thinking that this is something that is going to go away after the pandemic, I, I think that's not actually going to happen. What we're actually going to see is we're going to see even more demand for these things, right? And they're going to continue after the pandemic. So things like um, implementing things like QR codes, right? We're already seeing them in, in restaurants. That's likely going to continue and grow even further because people realize the convenience of being able to um, take a look at the menu before the server even comes to your table because it gives you a chance to really evaluate what you want to order without having somebody stand over you. So again, a level of convenience, whether it's for choosing versus paying. Um, and James mentioned it earlier, digital wallets, right? So the ability to be able to order something through Apple Pay or Google Pay or Click to Pay, um, and let's say concert tickets for when we're once again allowed <laughs> to actually go to a concert, but you can place your order online, not have to wait up, wait in a huge line, but at the same time, it automatically saves into your digital wallet, and then you just present your cell phone when you show up at the door. No printing, no nothing, right? So those types of models, we're definitely going to see um, growth in them. And for every business out there, it's really taking a look at how do I offer my consumers the ability to choose, the ability to um, purchase, the ability to pay, the ability to actually get my services and deliveries. Right. So even for things like services, you want to sign up for a yoga class. Are you going to have everybody line up before the class at the counter? It's a physical presence. They're coming into your facility, but maybe they want to pay before they even show up. So they know that they have a reserved spot. And then when they show up, they just want to go and take their class. Um, so that's the one thing that I would really encourage all businesses to take a look sorry, to take a look at. Um, the other thing is note something that Simon had mentioned earlier, which was uh, bill payments and recurring payments. So we've really thought about recurring catering towards very specific industries. But what we've noticed throughout this digital journey is card on file does not necessarily just mean uh, recurring payments. It means I just don't want to have to enter my credit card and go in search of it when I'm ready to check out. Just make it simple and quick. So whoever is storing that, whether it's a digital wallet, it's a click to pay, Apple Pay, Google Pay, um, the merchant, let's say Walmart's storing it or Rogers is storing it, just make that checkout experience simple for me where I can you know, be shopping for my groceries at three in the morning if I want to, because I want them to be delivered first thing in the morning, which is not unheard of for me. And I'm gonna continue doing that, right? Even after all of this shuts down, because it's, it's created a level of convenience for me and I've adapted my life to that, right? And I think a lot of other consumers are gonna be expecting the same. And I'll hand it over to uh, James. Yeah, I wasn't going to mention this, Marta, but when you talked about QR code, it's funny. Uh, you, know, you talk about how uh, pandemic has accelerated the move to digital and just our thinking. So 
I certainly espoused this thought a few years ago, uh, which was that why would Canada ever need QR codes because we're a full EMV payment marketplace and, and it would want to add. Um, and now I laugh at my, you know, my lack of vision uh, because clearly you know, what we've learned here is that uh, you know, these type of frictionless, uh, higher value interactions with customers, not higher dollar, dollar value necessarily, but higher, you know, more engaging interactions with customers are, are difference makers. And, and people will choose uh, to interact with merchants and retailers that offer those type of experiences. So that QR code, I would say, uh, from Interact's point of view, has become an increasingly important area of, of focus for how we're going to address the digital future. Um, yeah, just gathering my thoughts here a bit. So, you know, we kind of felt going into this that we were in a unique position given that we're really the only kind of ubiquitous coast-to-coast -coast, um, payment offering in the country that uh, connects every bank and, and, ch and checking account. Uh, so we had some insights that we could provide um, to retailers in terms of what, what's actually happening. Um, how are Canadians changing the way they transact? We know uh, omni-channel is becoming more and more important for them. Uh, and in times of economic uncertainty, um, people actually prefer to kind of stick with the money they have as opposed to, uh, at all costs, unless they absolutely have to, avoid extending themselves uh, beyond, beyond their means. So um, you know, we saw some interesting shifts, and I just wrote down some stats that I thought would be useful in sharing. So the younger generation has disproportionately um, led this shift to digital. Uh, we found that almost two thirds of millennials and close to 60% of Gen Z adults uh, told us they increased their frequency of use of digital payments during the pandemic. Um, and you know, it's that category kind of 25 to 34 uh, that are telling us they're, if whatever cash they use before, they're likely to use a heck of a lot less going forward. So, um, you know, cash and checks are, definitely uh, on the way out and I think even we're seeing cards are being you know uh, they've probably peaked and, and other forms of payment are, are going to start to disproportionately uh, grab some share uh, I would say though that you know don't put it all on on the younger generation so we actually found that there was a significant number of people 65 and up who have told us that uh, they used one or more of our platforms during the pandemic so that in percentage terms, 40% of people, there's 40% more Canadians in that age bracket said they use one of our platforms, either kind of for e-commerce payments or for money movement during the pandemic. And you know, I think specifically of my parents who were probably never going to be candidates to buy their groceries online, uh, but they were definitely scared for good reasons of going to the store uh, about a year ago. And they started to use it and that they're back going to their regular grocery store, but they occasionally supplement still with, with those online orders. So I'm supposed to say a lot of change across all demographics, maybe driven by the younger space, but you know, we shouldn't ignore that all Canadians uh, have made meaningful changes towards uh, more digital transactions, which, which aren't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna jump in. I was just had a thought and then I'll get into my remarks, but just oh, yeah, anecdotally, um, during the pandemic and even now how cash is no longer accepted at so many physical retailers. I was at a uh, market, they were asking for e-transfer, like even small sort of independent retailers. So it seems like, you know, we're in kind of a different society now entirely. And how does this industry support that society? And that kind of builds on a word you hit on, James, which I was going to speak about, which was Omni omni-channel and really where i'm at is i think for businesses or retailers specifically to stay competitive we need to have one view of the customer in the past we've had sort of our physical customers which were is which is obviously a bigger population historically in stores and then we've had our online customers and we were they were treated very differently and we had different information and simon hit on this i think at the top of the, the panel where you know in the retail space you really don't have a lot of info on your customers it's a one-time thing yes our customers at walmart were going in about 18 times a year versus rogers you know once every two years so we had more interaction, but we didn't have any data on them. We weren't able to personalize to them. Whereas our digital customers, we had a 
lot more information. We were able to collect it. We're able to serve them better knowing who they are and what they're about and what their preferences are. And specifically thinking of grocery, like if you're a vegetarian, if you're kosher, if you're, you know, these are things we're able to serve really well in the online grocery space. And there's still a lot of customers, James, you said it, a lot of those older generations who dip their toe into the online space are now going back to stores. And so how do we keep tabs on what those customers are doing in stores and connect them as one view of the customer? And I think financial services and payments has a huge role to play in identifying that customer and connecting what they're doing physically to what they're doing digitally and being able to provide them one experience. And so that's what I think is, is really important going forward is kind of treating the person wholly and also making sure that we create products and services for physical customers that engage them digitally. Um, and, and ideas that are at Walmart are, you know, an item locator, to find items or um, even financial services, like Simon, you said, offering in-store option to apply digitally for sales financing and connecting them that way. So one view of the customer for me is what it's going to take for retailers to stay competitive in this complex um, world that we're living in, Fatima. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I I couldn't agree more, Alyssa. I mean, as a consumer, just like listening to all of your insights. I mean, I, so something I, I sort of struggle with my parents as well. I mean, they also were the adopters of, of you know, digital payments and they're in the 80 plus category. So that was a huge change for them. But now having those conversations of them going back in store and whether or not we're ready for them, it's just, it's still not, they're still not quite there yet. So how do we keep them online is the question that we have in our in our household every day. How do we keep them comfortable with uh, early adoption and, and early tech? Um, we have quite a few questions rolling in from the audience. So I wanna make sure that we have time to get to them. Uh, so why don't we move on to final thoughts? The question here really directed at all of you is, you know, what do the next three to five years look like? You know, we've been through this pretty tumultuous change. Um, and, and where do we see this sort of industry heading? And, and how are you going to sort of stay competitive in the digital payment space? So Marta, why don't we start with you uh, for this one? And then we can move it along along the channel. And then I'll get into some Q&As. So, um... Alyssa actually hit my point, nail on the head. Um, basically, physical and digital are converging. So anybody who has built out their business models in the past, completely sub-segmenting these as I'm only physical or I'm only digital or um, they're two separate lines of business and I'm going to keep them as two separate lines of business, um, that's going to go away. So anybody who's been very traditionally focused on, um, I just need a terminal. I just need to put it on my counter. My customers will come to me. They will pick up my goods from me and they will pay me physically. A lot of that's going away as well. So for things like um, even things that we would traditionally think of as physical, consumers are going to now start coming into a physical space just because maybe they do actually want to just smell the fruit and feel the fruit when they're buying their, their groceries but they're gonna pay on their cell phone as opposed to a physical cash register. So that's digital right there, but in a physical space, right? Or on the flip side, they might actually prepay for everything. And let's say order everything online and prepay for everything online. Um, it is technically a digital experience, but maybe you're picking up in a kiosk, right? And um, maybe you're you're interacting in a physical space because you need to pick up your groceries at the train station in a kiosk right so again the, these types of um what we consider physical and what we consider uh digital we really need to start rethinking that and i think that's going to be the biggest shifts within the next few years definitely uh simon i'll throw it over to you for this one and then we can end with james yeah yeah there's a couple of thoughts like a First, when I originally was thinking about answering this question, everything that you talked about earlier, Marta, it really hits on what I'm, how I'm thinking about my organization, about how we think about recurring billing versus non-recurring charges. Card on file is so important to us. Um, me driving bill certainty and being finding a way to separate charges, like non-recurring charges from recurring charges, is a, is a major priority for me so that we can remove a lot of that friction we see and we make it more transparent in real time for customers to pay as part of those purchasing decisions so it makes it easier for them and uh, we don't do that today but that's something that we're definitely thinking about and 
card on file lets us get there. Uh, when you talked about the physical and digital piece, that really resonated with me as well, both of you listen, Marta, like I think steering people towards digital gives them that ease and convenience and that access that we want them to have. There's always going to still be opportunities for them to want to connect with humans and give them those experiences. Uh, it's about understanding how we give them the experiences they want and taking away those those effort, those experiences that create effort that we don't need to give them uh, by giving them a digital option. And I think that's really the path forward. And we're starting to see that uh, through the pandemic, which has been great. Uh, change management is is hard when it's when it's mandatory and required like a pandemic it really accelerates it so i agree with you it's going to be interesting to see how we sustain it now uh, and we have definitely have that opportunity and i'll pass it off to let's pass it off to james yeah james good uh okay i'll be quick fatiba i know you want to get yeah. uh, make sure we leave enough time for q a so you know i i would say um you know from our point of view uh, you know, we've invested meaningfully in this um commercial partnerships group at Interact because we view what we need to do over the coming years is really to get closer with our partners, be they banks, uh, retailers, uh, payment acquirers, or other entities in the payment space uh, to make sure that we're continuing to kind of satisfy their needs, uh, but also to kind of provide our own thought leadership in terms of trends we're seeing uh, to provide value to them in that manner. So yes, you know we're gonna need to be able to understand um, how we can support things like uh, you know, QR codes, loyalty. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more merchant wallets or proprietary wallets come out over the coming years. So we'll have to be able to play in that space. I think that is kind of my immediate answer. The other thing I would say, though, is that Interact is also beginning to look more broadly things that, I don't know if this is the right word, tangential to payment. So uh, how can we add more value in the realm of uh, digital ID, for example? Uh, we're making meaningful inroads in commercial payments. And so how do we work with our uh, commercial slash merchant retail partners to help them facilitate that part side of their payments business, which is an area that we haven't traditionally been involved in, but which is important going forward. So I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of work to do in the short term in the retail space, but our vision is you know, even expanding beyond retail payments. Great. Thank you, James. All right, I'm just looking into the moderator chat. We have quite a few questions, so I'm going to do my best to try to get through them all. But if I unfortunately can't get to your question, I apologize. Um, so the first question here is, a good segment of customers are enjoying shopping online and curbside pickup or delivery. How do you see the evolution of presentation of offers to curbside customers while picking up to drive back store in store? to drive back in store, in store shopping and sales. Um, I think we touched upon this a little bit throughout the panel, but I'm sure there's a lot more insights to share. So whoever wants to take this one. All right, Martha, go ahead. And I'm gonna assume Alyssa's got a lot to add on this mm -hmm. one as well. Um, but I, I think what it, it all of this is gonna come down to is really rethinking what the physical options actually offer. Right. So um, maybe not assuming that people will want to come in and browse. Right. So maybe people will want to um, come in and be efficient. Right. So a certain segment of your customer base, they'll want your location for easy pickup, but maybe they don't necessarily want to spend an hour just kind of browsing around and seeing what's there. So they want the option of being able to make that uh, choice and selection online, but they still want to be able to physically make that uh, payment when they come in in store. Um, so there's still going to be a sub-segment of those customers that are going to want to be 100 percent digital, but we are going to see customers that you know what, maybe they just don't know what a certain product is called. They don't even necessarily know what they're looking for. Maybe they really just want to go in and see what's available and then make their decisions. So going 100% digital isn't necessarily gonna work for absolutely everybody, right? And some people really just want that choice. So what's really gonna be, I think, more difficult for merchants is, um, Alyssa and James kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, is, we're going to start looking at people more as a digital identity and trying to figure out how do we start connecting how they interact in the digital space and how they interact in the physical space and how do we start kind of tying that persona together into some form of a single view of this consumer 
and then targeting your um, your campaigns to them. Because if you know that I, as a consumer, do not necessarily want to have somebody helping me in the store, just leave me be, let me make my choices. You can cater your marketing to me. But if I'm doing a lot of online searching and I have no idea what it is that I want, maybe you target me with your digital marketing just a little bit differently. So. Um, I think digital marketing is what's really going to be a game changer in the next few years. And that's going to be stepped up in a big way. Alyssa, I'm sure you have tons to add here, so I'll throw it over to you. Sure. Yeah, I, I think, you know, first of all, I, I am reading the question. It says, like, what offers do we want to get yeah. to draw customers back to, into stores? And my whole thing is, I don't want to draw customers to anywhere. I want to serve her wherever she is. And so I think Marta was hitting on that. But and I want to but I want to to add on to what she said. Yes, we serve her wherever she is and make it convenient and create value in all the touch points that draw her there. So mm -hmm. I think if we create dynamic value in the stores as opposed to creating, you know, a duplicate experience online to in stores, I think that's going to allow her to transact with us digitally on a weekly basis or every two weeks to do her groceries, but then to potentially go into Walmart to, I don't know, browse assortment that's not available online or or look at, we were testing last year and in in, I think at our Thornhill store, um, having a showroom for marketplace items in stores. Mm -hmm. So to be able to interact with items that aren't in the assortment in stores in person um, or create, you know, so I think it's all about creating value that's dynamic between the channels so that it's one journey through the channels. It can't be the same journey just per channel as Marta hinted on or else the customers will not uh, be engaged in all of your channels. And that's really what you want to see. So I think there's an opportunity to make it a connected omni-channel journey. I think all of the retailers and a lot of telecoms, and we're all working on this, what's sort of the interconnected omni-channel journey? And like Marta and James have said, the, the payment space has a huge role to play in driving um, that interconnectivity uh, that we're focused on. So I think that answers the question, you know, partially. It doesn't exactly speak to offers, but it speaks to the fact that, you know, I want to serve her where she is. I don't want to push her into any location, mm -hmm. you know? Let, let me ask uh, a follow-up. Uh, I don't know if it'd be Marta, Alyssa, Simon, but you know, I think that uh, there was a question I saw around Amazon Go style yeah. checkout. But but uh, here's where I'm going. I'll kind of bring that question into this. It's like people are more and more. Um, you know, you, your your answers here were really not about payments, right? They were about all these ancillary pieces with payment tied to it. So, what do, where do you see things go? So Amazon Go is like, you know, the there's there's not actually the checkout piece. Or if I think of when I ride an Uber or Lyft, um, I don't actually check out. Like I order and then I, I leave. So do you view that, like how important do you view that um, piece of either eliminating the the the, the action of checkout or, or reducing that friction? Mm -hmm. And I think our audience also wants to know, um, how do we see Canada sort of going towards a walk-in, walk-out, uh, no cashier type of experience? Exactly what James said, similar to Amazon Go. So we'll make it a two-part uh, question. And, and since he called on Marta, like, why not? Um, so again, I'm going to kind of hit on something that Alyssa had mentioned. Okay. Um, if somebody asks me, do consumers really think about payments? most people outside of our industry probably don't even know what this word is, right? And when we talk to our friends and family and we say we work in payments, most people probably don't really understand what it is, even though it is literally a part of every single thing that they do day in and day out, right? Um, so it's this foundation. But what they really care about is they don't necessarily care, did I take out a card out of my pocket and did I present it? They care about the experience, right? So not everybody is gonna want to have to carry a wallet around with them all the time. So I do think that we are getting more and more digital. And I think the way that we actually present payment, it is gonna keep shifting, right? And it is gonna keep getting into this more uh, frictionless experience. But some friction isn't necessarily bad. And this is where the experience will come into it is, and that's where what Alyssa mentioned, that that's really the critical piece, right? Is if I'm coming into a physical location, it's because I want to, right? Maybe I don't necessarily want to stand at a cash register and pay 
and that's not the experience that I want. But maybe the experience that I want is I just want somebody to advise me on what the best cell phone to buy is. And I just want to have a chat. Right. And that's the experience I'm physically there for. It's not for that end point to stand out of cash and pull something out of my wallet. And did I close my purse and then shove it back in? Like, that's not I'm not planning my day to go see how I'm going to carry my wallet around. I'm planning my day that I want somebody who's an expert on cell phone plans and cell phones to really advise me because I'm making the next purchasing decision. And that's that's the experience. And that's why I want to get in my car or I want to walk over to a store. Right. And and that's where I think the expectation that everything is going to go 100 percent frictionless. Um, not for everybody. Right. Some people still want to have human interactions. And I think that's what we really learned out of all of this. But the human interactions have to hold a value to that consumer. And and Alyssa, bang on on the point that you made. Um, that's what's going to be the really big driver for businesses in the future. Mm -hmm. So payments will always be there, but it, payments is adapting to help fill in these gaps on how consumers just want easy checkout. So businesses can really focus on how do you give them the best products? How do you give them that best uh, shopping experience? How do you give them the best you know, coming into, I don't know, your restaurant or really welcoming them as opposed to the experience of I'm standing at, over your shoulder ready to take your payment card, right? So we're really separating payments from the service and the experience that you're really offering your consumer. That was a great question, James, Alyssa, Simon, anything that you'd like to add? Otherwise, um, we can move on. I just say that, uh, you know, as much as I talked about loyalty and taking advantage of that moment of truth, at the end of the day, if I can save the customer time and effort and make the payments experience as quick, effortless, they're on automatic payments seamless as much as possible, then that'll, I'll always go there first because that's ultimately what I want to do for the customer is give them that time back in their lives. So it is a bit of a catch-22. Like there's an opportunity there with payments, but at the same time, we want to serve our customers and give them what they want, which is their time at the end of the day. So true product manager, Simon. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that brings us to the um, end of our panel discussion today. I wanted to profusely thank all of the panelists who joined us today. It was an absolute pleasure virtually sitting across from you today. I hope that we can do this in person again soon. Uh, to everybody who was listening, uh, I hope you enjoyed this session and thank you for tuning in and stay safe, everyone. Uh, happy almost lockdown restrictions being lifted. And thank you to the Interact team for putting this uh, session together today. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.